Welcome everybody to another episode of The Breakthrough Code. Really excited to have you here. And I've got a, a friend of mine that I've just admired for so many years here. He's a filmmaker, he's an educator, he's a writer, producer. He's done some amazing work. And we're gonna dive into some really cool topics today around creativ creativity, imagination, great. lots of great stuff. His name is Barnett Bain. We're a member of a group together, and I see you every couple of years when I make it, and, and you're there. But this is really the first time I've gotten to sit down and talk with you and, and learn from you. So welcome to our show. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you for inviting me. And it's good to see you again. You know, I didn't, haven't seen you for such a long time, and then I saw you two weeks ago. Two weeks ago down in Mexico, <laughs> yeah, which spurred me to invite you to come on to our show, so I'm really excited to have you here. Great to be here. You've you've produced movies, written for movies, uh, The Celestine Prophecy, which I remember was a book I read a long time ago. You worked on that. More recently, you worked on something called Milton's Secret, which right. which was uh, based on a book written by Eckhart Tolle, which I, I want to dive into that because sure. I'm a big fan of his work too. You uh, did another TV movie that you won, I think, an Emmy for called Homeless to Harvard. Uh, you won an Oscar for where, what dreams may come. So you have an incredibly accomplished career, but you're not just limited to that. You do so much. And I just want to dive in a little bit just to start with uh, creativity. Like some people think that, oh, I'm not creative like he is, right? You know, certain people are creative. What do you say to someone like that? You know, <laughs> I hear it all the time i'm yeah. not creative this is like a fish saying i i can't swim okay we're trained by the culture and uh, there are probably good reasons for that um practical reasons for that somebody has probably figured out a way to monetize separating you from your <laughs> birthright <laughs> and then selling it back to you. Yeah. The reality is there's nothing uncreative exists. Huh. So every thought and every feeling, every choice, every decision, every attitude that we have is a creative choice. There's choice making involved behind every one of those. It's not like they just happen. It's not like our breath, which just happens. Mm -hmm. You make a decision, you make a choice, there's volition involved. It is a creative act. Now, when I say it's a creative act, doesn't necessarily mean it's a positive act right. or a constructive yeah. act. Sometimes it's highly manipulative or, or counterproductive. Sometimes it's downright subhuman. But it is always a creative act. We have volition in our lives at every instant. We don't have omniscience or omnipotence. Mm -hmm. Although lots of times we tell ourselves, since I'm not omnipotent, I will pretend I'm omniscient. I'll pretend I know everything. And mm -hmm. we all know people like that. Yeah. <laughs> but we, we're not omnipotent, but we do have agency at every turn, at yeah. every single turn. And so, to get back to how people usually um, funnel down the Niagara Falls of creativity, yeah. by the time they're finished with it, they conceive of it like a drip from a faucet. Okay. How they do that is they aren't, we, we aren't um, aware, we haven't uh, acknowledged and embraced the truth that every act is a creative act. And we um, call creativity only that which is um which generates a painting a song right yeah yeah something that's artistic versus little creations we're making well i'm gonna day. i'm gonna push back on on the use of artistic okay. as well uh, because we are as human beings we are here to develop capacities to lead to lead artful lives mm -hmm. that doesn't mean to become a rembrandt <laughs> it means to live a life that has grace yeah. and has gracefulness yeah. that, um, that is meaningful. Um, even if it's not me, my, uh, even if my, the pursuit of what is meaningful to me is not meaningful to you, that is not, that is not part of the game. Yeah. Although in, uh, creating artifacts such as paintings mm -hmm. and 
a lot of that uh, has come to um, be valued only if it is meaningful to others, i.e. Yeah. if it can be monetized. Yeah, yeah. You know, um, I can remember being, as a young man, so I'm going to be an artist. I'm going to, I'm going to make artifacts with my life. And mm -hmm. I can remember people around me saying, um, well, what's plan B? Because <laughs> <laughs> so you're not going to make any money doing that, right? That's the thinking. Yeah. So um, for those uh, of those that are listening right mm -hmm. now who have, uh, who have, who are intrigued by, um, um, coaching by human potential mm -hmm. by uh, developing an intimacy with this with their psychological conditioning mm -hmm. as you start to dig more deeply into that what we begin to realize is that all of these ideas are conditioned we yeah. are we are trained uh, to believe that I, uh, can, I'm only valuable if I can monetize. Mm -hmm. And that the pursuit of um, a certain kind of internally directed, you know, the way a hound has its nose to the right. trail, I, I have my nose to something, I can't quite fathom it, but, I, yeah. but I'm gonna go for it, I'm gonna go for it. We get that trained out of it. Mm -hmm. and. It happens by somebody saying, well, you can't monetize it in a way that is clear to me. But yeah. every great athlete, every, any, anybody who has gone off trail yeah. finds that life supports them. Any really great entrepreneur learns to read supralogical signs sure. that do not, they do not they're not coded inside of logic and reason. I have a gut instinct. I have a hunch. Mm -hmm. Any great athlete knows where the zone is. Any great surfer yeah. knows which way the wave's going to break. Yeah. Any golfer knows, yeah. great golfer knows to trust these things. And artful living, creative living, means you develop the capacity and the trust to um, screen out all the why nots, yeah. all of the inputs that mitigate against leading an artful life. Yeah, it's burning so deeply and fiery in you, you don't even see those things. You don't see yeah. it. Yeah. You hear it, yeah. and you, you, right. you go into agreement with it. Yeah. Yeah, my dad, my teachers, my, my professors, you know, they discourage me from this, they encourage me to this, and now I lead a life that um, is very different from yeah. where I might have gone. Not, it, may, it may be incredibly pleasant. Yeah, let's talk about you for a second. So your movies, your projects are, uh, they're all about that. hope and- well, <laughs> They're but, about that. But, but they're positive, they're, they're positive yeah. messages, positive stories, probably not the easiest movies to get made in, in Hollywood. How did you decide to dedicate yourself? Well, I guess it is that, right? It's that. You heard people say, oh, they'll never, Celestine Prophecy or, or Milton's, uh, Milton's secret. secret. Yeah, you can't do that. Can't do that. <laughs> and can't, you did it. Can't do that. Yeah. I always hear, you can't do that. But my, there's a saying, I don't know who to attribute it to, but somebody once said, how you do one thing is how you do everything. Yeah. And, you know, and I believe that. Mm -hmm. I think that's true. Mm -hmm. So my, cre my creative life as it is expressed through my work mm -hmm. shows up at a particular kind of choices that reflect who, who I am and what turns me on. Yeah. My creative life as it is uh, expressed through my friendships mm -hmm. And it has the same fingerprint. Yeah. I mean, I'm sitting here talking to you. We're talking about this. Yeah. This is what my life is a really about this. Yeah. As is yours. So, you know, you find your tribe. My creativity as it's expressed in my um, personal life, in my family life, mm -hmm. has the same hallmark. Right. So it's all one thing. It is all a creative burst. Yeah. 
It's all the same thing. Do you see the potential for more positive based movies being made the, the types that we're talking about that you've done is that is it is it, is that changing at all i'm going to be a contrarian because really okay. i don't really give a damn about positive in the sense of empowering messaging is what i'm talking about anything that um, allows so uh, any impact that I can have on another human being, whether mm -hmm. it's my friends, yeah. my family, and, and conversely, I'm willing to be changed mm -hmm. by another. So, you know, I've, I've always thought that to honor myself or to honor another, honoring is the name we give to willingness to be changed by another person. Yeah. I honor you by my willingness to be mm -hmm. changed by you. Mm. And so... Any, anything that I can uh, bring to mm -hmm. another or receive from another that contributes, um, that contributes in some way to them, yeah. I'm, I'm down for. I'm completely yeah. down for it. Whether, whether that shows up in, um, in cheerleading messages, I don't <laughs> find that cheerleading messages are helpful for anybody. No, I, I never... I never got anything except as a child uh -huh. from a cheerleading message. So I, I do feel. So you don't see your work as cheerleading messages. What, what do you see? What do you see your work as? Provocative. Oh, okay. My Make work pisses thanks. off a lot of people as well. <laughs> if you're not, if you're not pissing off a lot of people, you are not playing at the edge of the field. You're ah. squarely in the field. So you don't mind someone saying, that movie, I, don't, I didn't like that movie, piss me I off. I have it all the time. <laughs> okay. So I, I'm, you never get hardened to it. <laughs> <laughs> it's still, it's but, still but like, why, why didn't you like my movie? You <laughs> never get hardened to it. But um, I'm more interested in something that reveals... Uh, the truth about myself mm -hmm. and allow somebody to see in their or in my work or in my friendship yeah something about their uh, nature something about what is beautiful and good and true yeah or something that about that is calculating and scheming and you know the parts of myself that I want to pretend don't live here in me mm -hmm. you know that I mm -hmm. If I can be vulnerable enough, and it's not always the case, for mm -hmm. somebody else to recognize that, you can't recognize something that's not you. Yeah. So cheerleading sells holiday cards. Yeah, no, it makes uh, you feel good for a little while. I remember watching Rocky, and I was so pumped up coming out of the theater, and then yeah. the next day, I was still a little pumped the next day, and then the next day after that, I'm like, eh. And I, I love those kind of, I yeah. love those kind of movies. Yeah. I love them. Uh, I don't see it as a positive message mm -hmm. because that Rocky is the story of a brutal life. <laughs> There's no part of that that um, th I think, yeah, I want that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I really want to be horse whipped on a regulation basis. Yeah. But, or movies like uh, there is um, one out now that's up for an Academy Award um, for international movie. Uh, All Quiet on the Western Front, the mm. remake. Okay. That is no day at the beach, and yeah. it's not inspiring. Yeah. But it, it come away from it asking questions. Okay. Um, Raging Bull. That is yeah. not a heroic story. That yeah. is a positive message, but you come away with it understanding truths about the human condition, about what mm -hmm. people will go to, yeah. to feel that they matter, yeah. that they connected, yeah. That they belong. Yeah. So if I'm watching a story about, or if somebody's telling me a story, or they could, you could be telling me you read the paper about mm -hmm. terrorist cells, mm -hmm. I understand um, what brings young men and women to a terrorist group you get yeah. a, a common cause you get yeah. a, a family you think, get you think you're you matter now these are uh, un, unhealthy expressions yeah. of deeply embedded human nature right i am interested in um, understanding yeah. what lies below the surface of things yeah so that i can uh, go there yeah. 
and not be reliant upon somebody's holiday good message, right? which in two minutes later they're selling me something I don't need. Yeah, well, in Milton's uh, secret, uh, it's a young boy rehashing, uh, learns rehashing the past, worrying about the future, is preventing him from finding happiness. And he's got, uh, you know, he doesn't have a really uh, amazing life by most people's standards, but... It's pretty good. Oh, it is pretty good. I mean, his life is... Um, a single mom, right? Nope, no, no. Oh, okay. you're mixing, uh, that was a good movie too, but different one. Okay. <laughs> Milton's Secret, and that is a very successful uh, family. Yeah. Oh, okay. Super successful family. He's got parents who are super successful, super mm. accomplished. Can't find a way to leave it at home. Okay. Always, always uh, run by the wild horses of the right. untamed mind. Always worrying about something. Dad's always got a deal going. Yeah. Mom's always got uh, another real estate to, to move. And ah. um, the grandfather played by Donald Sutherland yeah. um, is an old warrior who, um, pushing into his mid-80s, has lost many, uh, if not all, of his old comrades at arms. He's mm. lost many friends, and he has realized that he was um, a poor father, mm. a very poor father. Yeah. And um, he, he understands that um, all of this constant rumination, constant right. replaying the past, constant, constant thinking about the future. Yeah. Doesn't serve anyone, and right. it's making this young this youngster. Um, it's molding him in the image of his parents, mm. and so he. Which so many of us are molded in. We are right? all. Knowing, I think yeah. we're all molded that <laughs> yeah, way. Yeah, yeah. And this has happened to the Donald Sutherland character because yeah. his heart is broken. Ah. Uh. Because the way that he was going at it, which is the way the family is going at it, eventually it it leads to broken heart. Yeah. Or you turn off. Yeah. And so he, even late in life, made some shifts. And he, the, the young boy is blessed to have this gentleman in his life who mm. completely sees him and is entirely with him and is not trying to change him and is not trying to school him, mm. is just with him. Mm. And the boy has never had such an experience. Yeah. So the movie is... Because his parents never were with him. They're with them. Uh, they're, they're well. They're all, their phones are always going. Yeah, they're yeah, always. Yeah. They like always really have the. With them, yeah. They don't know how to park the interiority. Yeah. They don't know how to park the thought stream. They yeah. don't know how to. They don't know how to park it. Yeah. And I'm not sure that they want to. Mm -hmm. You know, they have agendas in yeah. life. They're, yeah. they're they're deal makers. They're yeah. they're entrepreneurs, and they're successful. And it's never enough. Yeah. So. The boy is uh, really blessed to, uh, his life has changed because he's had the experience of being with someone. Yeah. That is not making demands of him. That is seeing him and hearing him and listening to him and being with him. And from, he's intrigued by this old man and he watches him and he mm -hmm. realizes this, this guy um, does a number of things. He's not a worrier. Mm. And also something very simple, he breathes. He's mm. in his body. Mm -hmm. He's incarnated. He's mm. in his body. Mm -hmm. His parents are always breathless. <laughs> and when he notices they breathe, you know, so they're such a shallow breath, mm. they sip at mm. life. Yeah. Mm. And this old man is drinking up. Lives. He breathes <laughs> and he's aware of himself. Yeah. Breathing. Mm -hmm. And the boy realizes that when he's stressing, if he breathes, mm -hmm. the anxiety dissipates. It doesn't empty, yeah. but it dissipates. And so, um, you know, it's, it's, the movie mattered to me yeah. because I wanted to tell a very, um, a family kind of story yeah. that uh, was subversive in a lot of ways. Um, you got a twinkle in your eye when you say that. You really do like to yeah, do yeah, intriguing you know. things. Yeah, I, I love the message in this story. I 
I grew up without a dad. Yeah. And uh, when I and but my grandfather was really influential on me. Right. He was a great teacher, and I loved. You know, uh, the other grandkids were like, you know, they'd come up and they'd be running off. I just would sit there with my grandfather and just listen to his wisdom. And he had been in World War II and and knew uh, Eisenhower very well as a friend of his. And he'd been with meetings at Churchill. And Those guys just, had things to share. Yeah, and it was just so much fun. But then when I had kids, because I grew up without a dad, even though I, you know, had businesses and was was focused on that, it was so important to me. My number one job, I always felt, was my, my children. Like, if I screwed that up, it didn't matter how much money I made. That's right. And so that was really my focus. Um, you know, the other piece of it yeah. that, I, that uh, attracted me originally uh, made me want to do the story. Mm -hmm. And, and as, you, as you said before, you know, you're absolutely right. Nobody wanted to make this movie. Hmm. Nobody wanted to finance it. You know, that stuff is always a drag. Yeah. But it was a movie about bullying. Mm. And there's a part of the plot that has to do with a, a bully, a huh. young bully. Yeah. But what I wanted to bring across is the bullying doesn't start out there. The bullying starts very young. We, we are trained to become victims of bullying hmm. or bullies. Yeah. We are trained to do that. And how are we trained to do that? Well, we are trained to um, empower that inner bully, mm -hmm. that inner voice. You're not enough, you're not good enough, you're not smart enough, that's not a pretty enough drawing at school, yeah. you're not as smart, you're not as good, you don't belong in the playground. We are trained to empower that and to believe everything you hear. Yeah. And to believe everything you think. Yeah. And so um, whether you are a bully on a playground or a bully in the boardroom, mm -hmm. it begins with that internal dialogue. And yeah. if you treat yourself, if we are trained to treat ourselves as objects, mm -hmm. and we are the culture conspires to teach us to treat ourselves as objects. We either overeat, or we don't sleep when we're tired, or we, mm -hmm. we overwork, or whatever, whatever it is, it gets nobilized. Mm -hmm. If you treat yourself as an object, pretty soon you will treat others as an object. Right. And uh, that was more than anything what Milton's Secret is about. I love it, yeah. And we can, we can really only be bullies when you see yourself not connected to other beings, right? When you see yourself just this physical body and I've got to make it in the world, and one way to make it is just to force you to acquiesce to what I want you to do, which is a, a very, and it, it works sometimes, right? It, the, the thing about it is it almost always works until it doesn't. Yeah. And then when it doesn't, like you look at Harvey Weinstein, yeah, right? Exactly. When it doesn't, then people will throw you under the bus so quickly, even though they yeah. were kneeling down to you before because they were doing it because you were forcing them to, or they were afraid of you, or they felt like only you could give them power or, or help them out. So, Well, you know, we, both of us um, coach entrepreneurs. Yeah. So um, I sometimes see in in my work with, um, with entrepreneurs that they're not aware that, they're, that they are either bullies yeah. or being bullied. They're not even aware of it. Yeah. They're not aware that they're unilateral in their communications. Right. You know, they're not aware that there's judgment that is being freighted. You know, you're working, you have, you have direct reports. Yeah. And, uh, they're not always aware that they don't empower those those yeah, folks well, to true. to run their own game. Yeah, and then support them when they applaud them when they meet goals and support them in teasing out why they might not be meeting goals yeah. as opposed to laying on the whip. Yeah, and, and this you, happens in the family as well. Yeah, and when you lay on the whip, you stifle creativity because now someone's just waiting for you to tell them what to do. I had this one uh, really wonderful being, but he didn't know what is the impact of his communication. He, he headed up an insurance company, but 
that I ended up owning a piece of because we helped coach him and he tripled the size of his business. But uh, he would lose his temper sometimes and he would you know, say things that he would regret later. If I was coaching him on it, I remember I came up one time. So how the week goes? Well, you had one, one thing happened that wasn't so great. So what happened? Well, he had a couple assistants. He said, one of my assistants, I asked her to do whatever it was, and she, she didn't do it the way that I wanted to, and I kind of blew up, and uh, you know, and and it wasn't. I'm not proud of what I did. I said, well, all right, well let's um, let's bring her in. Let's see the impact of what happened. And so I went out and. She was right outside his office. And I said, hey, you know, can you come in a minute? You know, uh, Len and I want to talk to you. And she looked at me. And she was, it was like a week later. She's still like nervous, right? And I said, no, it's okay. Come on in. And uh, I think her name was Marcel. And I said, Marcel, do you remember last week when Len, when you, uh, Len wanted you to do something and it, maybe you didn't do it quite right? And and he he got upset with you. And, and she she's looking at me. And then she kind of looked over at him like, can I talk, <laughs> right? And, and uh, he said, you know, go ahead. She said, uh, yeah, no, I remember. I said, well, what was the impact of that? She said, uh, I, it was, I felt terrible. And, and she said, I still feel terrible today. Now, that was impacting her work for a week because part of her mind was still on that event. Her work? Yeah. Her home life? Yeah. If she was a mom, impacted her mothering. Yeah. If she was a spouse, impacted her relationship. Yeah. And Len, that's his style. Yeah. Well, but he had the courage to, to face it, and which he is, did make shifts. Which yeah. is fantastic. Yeah. Which is, that's a monumental yeah. leap forward. And what once you make start making those those leaps forward, once yeah. the penny drops, yeah. it can drop exponentially quicker when you let in, hmm, that is my style, which I'm now breaking. Mm -hmm. But that style does not only live in the C-suite. Yeah. I bring that style home. Oh, yeah. I bring that style to the dinner table, yeah. if, such as it is. Probably I don't have dinner with my family. Yeah. But I bring that style into the bedroom. I bring that style. My kids are very familiar with that yeah. style. Yeah. And probably they are either... They're responding it into some into it in some way. They're either emulating it, yeah, or they're rejecting it, yeah. One or the other. One or the other. So, the fabulous piece of that is uh, for for him to acknowledge to Marisol, yeah, to apologize, yeah, and then to to bring that home and to say, you know. Not make a big deal of it, just yeah. to say at home, yeah. with this, depending on how old these kids are, I really blew it. Oh, really? Yeah. You want to hear how I blew it? They may or they may not, but you, yeah. you share with it anyway. I really yeah. blew it. I realized something about myself, and I don't, um, that's not who I want to be. And that creates a huge opening to really make a shift. That without schooling anybody, yeah. without saying take my advice because I'm not using it, which is how, we, yeah. which is how I usually used to parent. Yeah. <laughs> like, you're modeling a humility right and a vulnerability and a willingness yeah. to change and to be changed by others yeah. i hurt this la this lady yeah. marisol and that is not a way to be yeah. that's not a way to lead yeah and it it's not healthy for the company right she wasn't as productive at work so even from a business standpoint it you wasn't fire her up boy it'll be productive yeah. you diminish uh, yeah. you diminish your colleagues it doesn't yeah. end well yeah in the breakthrough code we talk about everything being energy right and and so we're always shifting energy and, and using energy in different ways. Let's go, let's go to, um, uh, we call it in the Breakthrough Code, upgrading your story, yeah. and, you know, to upgrade your life. Because at the end of the day, you know, you're a storyteller, right? You're you a change storyteller your story, you change so your people. life. Yeah. And so, but we, we, we are our stories. We, we adopt stories growing up. We create stories sometimes unconsciously. Sometimes consciously, we, we have an informed opinion, rarely, probably more unconsciously. But we do have the ability, and, and, and you were talking about uh, what's necessary to upgrade stories. You wrote a book called The Third Story Book. Yeah. But you, you said that imagination has to be uh, active for you to upgrade your story. Talk a little bit about that. And I'm a big fan of that, too, because Einstein said imagination is the preview of coming attractions, right? He said, imagination is more important than knowledge. So talk to us why imagination, which you're such, you're so creative and you use your imagination so much, but talk to people why that's so critical if they want to upgrade their story. 
Okay, I'm going to back it up a little bit, and then mm -hmm. we'll okay. we'll ramp into that. Okay. Um, the you mentioned the third story. So after decades as a professional storyteller, mm -hmm. I have heard I have heard thousands and thousands and thousands of iterations and st iterations of stories and stories about stories and kind of style yeah. uh, f pitches and magazine articles <laughs> and books and from my dentist even you know yeah. with my, my mouth open and he's working away in there and he's pitching your story <laughs> everybody's pitching yeah. stories yeah. and i realized there's only three kinds of stories that i've mm -hmm. heard the first story is the story of what happened to me yeah i uh, got short shifted yeah. i was born with a silver spoon i yeah. was born with a lead spoon i was born with no spoon <laughs> yeah. i had the worst time i had the best time yeah i had the time it, what happened to me yeah i was abandoned i was smothered i was inundated yeah. and everything in between yeah. and we all see those stories and we hear them amongst uh, people that we know or people that we work with they they lead with you know, I was raised with, um, you know, with by my grandmother, mm -hmm. and so I'm mm -hmm. I, I'm sensitive to you. You hear that. Yeah. Then there's the second story. The second mm -hmm. story is how I got over the first story. Mm -hmm. The second story is I worked my butt off, yeah. you know, and I went through. I, I got an MBA, yeah. or or um, or I became the biggest loser in the world. <laughs> And, you know, I was on Skid Row and I ended up compulsive behaviors here or there mm. is how I responded to it. Mm. So not every second story is a is a, yeah. uh, is a, a <laughs> woe to win story. Yeah, Sometimes yeah. it's a woe to worse story. A win to woe story. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. So um, the, uh, the American dream. Yeah. Myth, that is a second story. Yeah. If you work really hard, if yeah. you get, you know, you can be the president or you can own the bank or you can, yeah. you can have the happiest marriage. If you, if you work, 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 work. Yeah. Second story. Then there's something that I call the third story. Mm -hmm. The third story is after I'm going to, I'm going to quote uh, Joseph Campbell, who I mm -hmm. was, I had the pleasure to meet and spend some time with as a young man. Mm -hmm. The third story is what happens when you spent a lifetime climbing the ladder of success mm -hmm. or climbing or, or sliding down the ladder of success <laughs> and realize um, you had it up against the wrong wall. <laughs> now, it, I'm not suggesting that people uh, uh, invariably become disappointed in their lives. On the mm -hmm. contrary, that's not what yeah. I'm saying at all. Sometimes that does happen. Mm -hmm. But what I'm saying is, you know, you you work towards something, you work towards something as a young woman or a young man, and then there's a certain kind of seasoning that happens in your life. And without any advance warning, the sets change, the actors change, and <laughs> somebody switches the script on you, yeah. and your values and your motives all change in a matter of months. And mm -hmm. it's surprising. Now, I have never encountered uh, some uh, a, a person who reaches a certain age and does not have that. So mm -hmm. they, oh, they, we used to hear a lot about the, the mid-age crisis. Yeah. I don't hear so much about the mid-age crisis anymore. I don't see it. It is a uh, end zone crisis now. Hmm. For some reason, that calamity midway mm -hmm. through my life's journey, I yeah. came to a place in a dark wood and the yeah. way was lost. That seems to have advanced. In, it's happening later in life? It's, I, I, this is purely anecdotal yeah, on my yeah. part, but I, I, I don't see it happening in the 50s. It's happening hmm. like 60s, 70s. Hmm. It's happening people don't want to... Um, retire or they want to retire i mean those are those life choices are the cover for something else that's going on yeah now what is it that's really going on i uh, i wonder what is that third story about it's a different set of values and it's a different set of calibrations and modulators mm -hmm. we're no longer modulating the world through logic 
and reason. This happened to me, therefore. Mm -hmm. This, that, this, that, mm -hmm. which is the psychological model. Mm -hmm. By the time we get to this stage, we're pretty intimate with our psychological patternings. We, you know, we've all done some work, yeah. some more intensely than others, but everybody yeah. has been around the block by this point. Yeah. We know how we, our psychological patterns came to pass. Yeah. So this isn't about that. This is about energy. Yeah. This is about inching into uh, an understanding and an experience that at one level, life is uh, the product of certain choices. Mm -hmm. And at a deeper level, we're trafficking in energies. Mm. The real juice is energies. Mm -hmm. So I'm biting, I'm biting off a lot here. We'll see how much we can chew and how much we can swallow. Yeah, we got a couple minutes left. All so, right, yeah. so <laughs> the arena of energy mm -hmm. is imagination. Okay. I agree. Imagination. Totally yeah. Your imagination. That's how we get energy in motion. That's yeah. how you get it in yeah. motion. And, you know, the, the narratives that come and go, they're fleeting, they arise, they, yeah. they, uh, they're not abiding, they fall away. That is just light on the screen. It's like going to the yeah. movies. You know, you can put up somebody's movie, mine or somebody else's, it's light on the screen, and two hours later, it's gone, you got a screen. <laughs> yeah. So, life of logic and reason we uh, we embrace it 110 percent while it's happening and as we mature we realize wait there's something deeper behind what's flickering on the screen yeah. it's the screen itself yeah. the screen itself is imagination mm -hmm. is awareness is consciousness is mm -hmm. the awareness and the the runnings and jumpings of the first story and the second yeah. story the 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 triumphs they are uh, suddenly put in a different perspective. Now, to change, when we say we, if you change your story, you'll change your life, all that's true. And usually it's, it's um, framed in this kind of context. If you change your thoughts, if you change your beliefs, if you change your choices, your actions, your decisions, your feelings, those can be modulated yeah. to a degree. Yeah. If you change those, you'll have different outcomes. Yeah. Uh, that's true for about six inches down. Yeah. So, you know, you'll end up getting some decent f f first quarters, yeah. maybe a parking spot in yeah. front of where you need yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. And it'll work initially. Yeah. And then eventually it's, it has diminishing returns. What is really going on is we are dabbling in, uh, energy in playing with energies. Yeah. yeah. And when we develop a capacity to um, when we develop our imaginations further, we're now flexing the muscle. We're flexing the screen itself upon which all that stuff gets right, gets right. played. Yeah. And so I, I know we only have a few minutes left. Uh, so I will. Yeah. Well, what I like what you said too when we chatted earlier was that when you use your imagination your nervous system now is shifted so you can lean into yeah. that new story. Your, if, your subconscious- You're just giving yourself a little thought every now and then. then you're it, making your subconscious conscious. Right. We are, all of us, moving every day- That's right. Through our own subconscious. Yeah. Let that in. Yeah. Think about that. Everything that is around us yeah. is your own subconscious and collective unconscious. We are consciously moving through it. Yes. That's what, yeah. that's what all the work that we, you're doing with your coach and yeah. beginning to, to make it more and more real. So now if you want to um, exponentially accelerate that process, you start making choices. Yes, I'm going to shift some of my beliefs. I'm going to shift some of that. But I want to be able to develop my capacity to imagine so that yeah. I can hold changes that start coming at me beyond the threshold of my zone of familiarity. I love that, yeah. You know, there's, there's a certain field in which I operate. I know how to run up at it. I know how to yeah. run down it. I know how to run across it. I could even be the master of it. Yeah. But I start changing a little too much. Things now begin to intrude upon my field that are outside of my comfort zone. Right. And I, with which I'm unfamiliar and I contract and I will go back to the old playbook yeah. unless I have developed a capacity 
to expand my imagination. Yeah. Not just my imagination about my stories about myself. Yeah, yeah. Can I see myself in such a, a situation? I don't mean that. Yeah. I mean literally my capacity to imagine. Can I learn to play a new instrument? Mm -hmm. Can I learn to... Can I learn to um, do nonlinear thinking? You know, when I yeah. were talking before, the, my phone has something like five million color distinctions on it. Yeah. So if I say to you, you know, what's your favorite color? And you tell me yellow. I'm going to say, can you do a little better than that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yellow? Yeah, yeah. Which yellow? Yeah. So now you begin to play with yourself. Well, yellow like uh, rust on a bumper. Right. Yellow like um, we begin to... Uh, apply ourselves in all the infinite ways that are possible to develop our capacity to imagine ourselves. And then, you know, as the movie, they said in the movie, if you build it, they will come. If you yeah. develop a capacity to imagine, it will find ways to make use of itself. Yeah, absolutely. And it, and it creates so many possibilities that just don't exist within the current realm of our thinking. So, yeah, they, you've been amazing today. You really are so creative you use your imagination uh, so incredibly well and and you inspire me thanks so much for being here barnett really uh, you a pleasure really are an to be inspiration. here yeah and thank you all for tuning into the breakthrough code we love having you here every every time we have a show so keep coming and we'll see you again soon